Okay, I'm back. So I'm going to wait for you guys to join, and then I'll, I'll talk about, um, she had a question on how do you begin cleansing the gut, and uh, I will wait until everyone joins before I start talking about that. Keep in mind, guys, it's not about cleansing the gut. There's a lot of like misinformation. You don't cleanse your gut. You, you don't want to cleanse your gut. You want to rebalance your gut. Your gut is an ecosystem from mouth to anus, and it's supposed to work in a specific way. Your saliva is supposed to be rich in enzymes, and you're supposed to saturate your, your food with saliva. Then you swallow it down, and your stomach is super acidic. It's supposed to be as acidic as battery acid, and, and it pulverizes your food. It, it, it's like a bag that just like pulverizes with battery acid. A lot of people don't have battery acid. They have like apple cider vinegar type acid. And then that food drops into the top of the small intestine and your gallbladder is right there to secrete bile that has been created by the liver. And that has a lot of the hormones and junk in it, but the bile also has a role and it helps you, um, uh, digest your fats and keep the small intestine clear of bacteria because your small intestine is your gut. When we talk about the gut, the small intestine has microvilli and villi, and it's responsible for actually extracting nutrients from food. There is no bacteria in there. Or there should not be any bacteria in there. And there's plenty of evidence showing that the, the less there is bacteria in the small intestine, the healthier the person is. Because the whole goal there is you want your body absorbing nutrients there. You don't want your body fermenting and rotting and breaking down things there. That's for the large intestine. And then the pancreas is over here on the left side and it secretes enzymes, right? So it secretes enzymes that further help you digest your food as well as the small intestine. And so all these enzymes are breaking down your food in the small intestine, your, your food's going through the small intestine. And then you have this valve in between the small intestine and the large intestine. That's right where the appendix is. And we know that the appendix is a big bag of bugs. And um, the ileocecal valve will open, it's a one-way valve, and let the food that came from the small intestine into the large intestine. And this is where your ecosystem should reside. You have lots of different bacteria that take the, what's left of the food and start fermenting and breaking it down. They eat, but then they secrete. They eat and secrete, and they secrete B vitamins, vitamin K2, lots of good things for you and that you end up absorbing absorbing into your bloodstream and utilizing. However, when this large intestine, when, when this whole system starts breaking down, big chunks of food and pathogens are making it to the small and large intestine. There begins to be bacterial overgrowth. That ileocecal valve gets stuck open and things start to crawl into the small intestine. Then we've got pathogenic bacteria that are eating all the nutrients your bacteria are making you in the large intestine. And so a lot of people are like, you need to cleanse your colon. And I'm like, that's not gonna do anything because the system has broken down. So the first step is getting your metabolism and your blood sugar balanced, lowering your stress with food. Your body cannot feel like it's in fight or flight or it will not prioritize digestion. So the first thing is nourishment. The second thing is evaluating your stress levels. If your stress is high, your gut is gonna function low. That's just how it goes. If your body's in a fight or flight state, your body's not going to eat your food or digest your food. It's not planning for the future, it's just planning for right now. And so you've got to eat in a non-stressed out state. You've gotta take deep breaths. You've gotta be relaxed. You can't scarf down food while you're driving and expect your body to digest it properly. And then we've got to work on seeing what's going on in your small intestine. Is there a lot of bacteria there? If so, you've got to kill it. And you've got to also nourish your good bacteria in the process and help your large intestine proliferate. So all of these things are important. There's a lot of, of caveats to gut healing, you know, the migrating motor complex and um, gastric emptying and closing the ileocecal valve, which is what, you know, why, my, why I have a job. You know, th these are things that are way too hard to do on your own. And this is why people struggle with gut healing forever because they never know what they're supposed to be doing or they're doing one portion of it and they're not doing the rest. And so it does take a holistic approach and in seeing what the individual person is struggling with and fixing it from the root cause. But the first step is always nourishing your body, getting your stress levels down, getting enough sunlight, getting enough sleep and getting exercise because we are responsible for moving our our intestines and then once that's happening and there's still issues going on at that point you start to you run a gut test that's why I use the GI map and I like to see what strains of bacteria and fungus and things we're dealing with where the elastase is where your immune system is your IgG and then we go from there and we 
create a protocol and we start working on slowly changing the balance, the microbiome, the whole thing, because we have to kill. This is why I call it the weed nurture plant protocol, because we have to weed, we have to kill the bad stuff. If there is some, we've got to nurture, we've got to feed your good stuff with the proper prebiotics. There are specific types of fibers that only feed specific types of bacteria, but then we've also got to plant. We've got to put in good bacteria and the environment is really going to determine if that good bacteria stays around. And then I also add in a bind part of that protocol because when things are dying, we need to make sure we bind to the toxins that are that are, you know, being carried out. And then we've always always we're always nourishing and we're always supporting detoxification through that whole process. So yes, it is it can be a very very detailed process and it's different for every single person just depending honestly on what's going Going on in their in their digestive tract. Okay, so Cecilia asks, selenium and zinc are needed with iodine. Not necessarily supplementing them, but you have to make sure you're getting them. I honestly wouldn't supplement iodine without selenium, but zinc is one of those things where, like for example, I eat oysters a lot for zinc, and so I don't need to supplement zinc all the time. I might supplement it like once or twice a week. I am like someone who has, I have like a lot of supplements, but I don't take them every day. Like I, I will be like, hey, I haven't gotten some, a zinc rich food in a while. I'm gonna pop a zinc right now. Or like, oh, I, I'm, I'm working on my thyroid right now. I'm gonna have some selenium and vitamin C. But I'm not someone that's like gonna eat like stacks of supplements a day because I, I eat a very nourishing diet. I use supplements as tools. Any questions to ask a naturopath when discussing digestion issues and hormone imbalances after long-term hormonal birth, birth, sorry, like I just like literally destroyed that question, after long-term hormonal birth control use? Yeah, so you first of all want to make sure you've had three cycles since you've been off birth control. You want to make sure you're ovulating. So make sure that she runs your, your hormones five to seven days after you ovulate to get your progesterone levels proper. You also want to check in with inflammation, C-reactive protein, because long-term birth control use can cause inflammation. And then you also want to make sure that your blood sugar is okay and your insulin levels are, are okay, because inflammation is going to equal insulin resistance and blood sugar issues. Um, your stress levels, you need to have Evaluate those low progesterone for a long term, which is what birth control does, can increase cortisol and adrenaline, um, and your thyroid. That's the biggest one. A lot of times, long term hormonal birth control use is gonna equal a thyroid issue, um, and then she needs to make sure that you're doing, you, you know, you you evaluate what's going on in the, in the gut. So, do you have SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Do you have Candida? Do you have bacterial overgrowth? See if she does like some type of comprehensive stool analysis, um, and maybe even evaluate your micronutrients because the pill does deplete a lot of nutrients so you would want to uh, make sure that you're not depleted there so you know I know that's a lot but um, if you're going to a naturopath sometimes it's like you want to ask all the questions and uh, go in as prepared as possible um, or is selenium always needed as a supplement type? I think selenium is a good supplement to consider a lot of times, especially if you struggle with thyroid issues um, and you're not like eating a super nutrient dense diet, like not a lot of shellfish or seafood. Um, selenium is one of those things where we, we would normally get it from the soil, um, but our soil is so depleted, it's like we're not getting a lot. So I don't know, I, I would consider it, even if it's just not like every single day, it's maybe a couple times a week. What do I think of spirulina? Eh, I'm like neutral on it. I think it tastes like the devil's piss. Like it's disgusting. Um, but I know some people like it. I, I don't know why. Um, but yeah, it can have some like some good um, nutrients in there. Um, it can have a little bit of iodine, trace minerals, things like that. But I don't know. It is a freshwater algae, so it can be detoxifying of heavy metals, just like chlorella. I really like chlorella and spirulina together and sometimes find that it is a, a good effective uh, detoxification support while you're doing other detoxification, but I don't think it's like necessary. I'm not like, ooh, you need that spirulina. I'm like, if you want it, great. I like to like overly simplify my life in a sense. Like, 
when I first started my health journey, gosh, you guys, I had this, like, huge collection of powders. Like, it was, like, uh, it's ridiculous the amount of superfood powders I have. I have, like, now I think about it, I'm just, like, I just want to laugh at myself so hard because I, I had, like, spirulina and chlorella and, like, camu camu and, like, everything that you could consider, like, I had it. And now I'm just, like, God, who has time for that, you know? Like, I only now eat what I like and I eat um, what I find is actually helpful and beneficial to me. And if spirulina does truly give you a big benefit like you see a difference great but if not uh don't you know don't waste your money or your space my naturopath is very against fruit juice because she says it causes fatty liver disease how do i convince her this is not the case watch my um watch my story on fructose and swipe up at the end i gave you guys all this research including the study that was done in Sweden, I think it was Sweden, uh, that shows that fruit juice does not cause fatty liver disease. Um, that is like, it again, it's one of those things where I get so annoyed, you guys, because it's like one scientific study comes out that says maybe this might cause this, and then the media gets a hold of it and starts to blow it out of proportion, and then like everyone hears it. It's like a game of telephone. It goes from Fruit may, fructose may cause fatty liver disease to fruit juices cause fatty liver disease. And I'm like, they did the experiments. Most of the experiments against fructose are from high fructose corn syrup. You guys, high fructose corn syrup is a very, very different than the fructose found in fruit juice or fruits completely different fructoses. Keep in mind that high fructose corn syrup, they say it's pure fructose. It is not pure fructose. It has a lot of the corn starch left in it from what they're extracting it from. So to say that fructose causes fatty liver and you're only using fructose powder or high fructose corn syrup in a study, that's still not fruit juice. Like I need to see that fruit juice causes fatty liver and then maybe you can convince me of that but I'm so sick of quote-unquote scientists doctors naturopaths whoever you are telling me that something is science when in reality there is no science it is just complete hearsay um, I, I, I get really annoyed because it's very very lazy as a practitioner to just say like this is what happens look into it for yourself before you start fear-mongering your patients or your clients into believing something that is just purely not true but that's just that's just me sorry guys I just get a little passionate about it Hey Jess, I downloaded that Flow app that was recommended. It says I'm in my luteal phase, but I'm on day 38. I have ovulation cramping, but nothing is there, anything to help. You guys, um, apps cannot predict your, your ovulation. The only way you can do that is with your thermometer. Um, and your, you know, if you stick a finger up your vagina, feel for cervical uh, fluid and your uh, cervical position. It's very important for women who have irregular cycles to start getting very familiar with their bodies. Flow app can be really helpful to kind of start to get you an idea of what happens in each phase of your cycle. However, you truly want to know when you're ovulating and you truly want to know which phase of your cycle you're in, you have to start tracking your body. Check out the book Taking Charge of Your Fertility by Tony Weschler because I think like it's so important for every single woman to have a manual that they can understand their body better. But keep in mind, if you have long cycles, you have long follicular phases. You do Usually women don't have long luteal phases. That's not what happens. And so when you have irregular cycles, your follicular phase is lasting a very long time. You're ovulating late, and then you get your period anywhere from like 10 to 15 days after about. So um, if you have ovulation pain, you probably haven't even ovulated yet, and you're still in your follicular phase. But the only way you would know that for sure is not rely on an algorithm or an app and uh, track it yourself. What could be the cause of achy joints, specifically shoulders I sleep on? No injury already, checked with doc, any advice to help it? Cairo PT done. Um, where are your cortisol levels? Keep in mind, remember cortisol adrenaline eats through your tissues, including your joint tissue. So this is why, like when I was on keto, I also dislocated my shoulder. Um, doing an exercise that I've done a thousand times I, don't get me started. Um, anyways, just know where your cortisol levels are at. Um, what is your past? What's your health history? Um, sometimes it can be something as simple as like low magnesium, low calcium, or just cortisol being high. It's kind of eaten through the joint tissue and you need to replenish like gelatin and collagen and things like that. 
but um, yeah, that's that's what stress hormones do. Collagen versus gelatin. Gelatin is honestly my favorite. It's more pure, but it can be a little bit more inconvenient because it like thickens everything up. So like, you, well, you could put it in a smoothie, but <laughs> the funniest thing happened, you guys. So I was out of collagen, but I still had gelatin. So I put I put gelatin in my smoothie thinking like, oh, it'll be fine, right? So I'm like blending it and it's like getting this, my smoothie is becoming this mass and it's getting bigger. And I, I like, I use a Nutribullet. And it's like getting bigger. It's like this bigger and bigger mass. And then my blender starts to go like, and I was like, okay, I got to stop this. And I like open it up and my smoothie is just like this big fat blender shaped jello. Like that's all it was. It was like this jiggly jello. And I tried to eat it with a spoon, but it just like didn't work very well. It was like this chunky jello. And I was like, God. So sometimes gelatin um, can thicken things up. Or if you eat too much of it, it can cause like a, it can kind of disrupt your stomach. It's not because it's bad. It's actually because it's doing good. It's very, very powerfully like anti-inflammatory and uh, can break down a lot of junk that's going on in the gut. But some people are like, oh, I can't like the gelatin hurts my stomach. So collagen has been broken down. It's been hydrolyzed. The proteins have been broken down so it doesn't thicken in liquid. Um, sometimes this process can denature some of the proteins so it's not as pure. It's not as like potently good for you as gelatin is but it's kind of like that thing where I'm like I gotta meet people in the middle sometimes and uh, I don't expect them to deal with like a jello smoothie every time they blend their smoothies so I think they both have a, a purpose and I, I eventually like to have both on hand but if you're gonna um, do one or the other um, and you can tolerate gelatin gelatin's better but collagen it tends to be more convenient when you say to lift heavy, which exercises could I do at home or is a gym membership needed? Gym membership is not needed, you guys. I'm just someone that like, if I'm like trying to work out at home, I just never end up doing it. So for me, like getting out, going to the gym, plus I work from home. So it's like, I like, it's my like daily outing, you know, like I like to get out of the house sometimes and feel like I have a routine. And when you work from home, it can get really weird when you like haven't left your house in like seven days and you're like, okay, there's something wrong here. So um, I like going to the gym for that reason. It's not that I need a gym to work out. You can absolutely do workouts at home. I think some some good sized kettle, kettle, kettlebells are probably necessary, some resistance bands, and some type of, of weight. So maybe start with lower weights, like you know, five pound dumbbells, seven pound dumbbells, even 10 pounds, just depending on your strength. And then, um, get heavier kettlebells and you can do squats, deadlifts, good mornings. You can do bicep curls, shoulder presses. Um, like, uh, you can do like front raises. You can do tricep, you know, extensions. You can do tricep dips on a bench. You can do, um, like squat presses. You can do like wide stance squats, narrow stance squats, suitcase squats, squats. You can do weighted lunges. You can do one leg lunges. Like I like to do lunge ups where I'm like in a lunge position and then I like lunge up and I like press the kettlebell over my head. I like to work out, you guys. I do want to like make a workout program at some point. Um, I love to lift weights. I think it's like so empowering. And I just like, you know, the past like five months since I started building Fully Nourished, I used to like uh, work out every day, lift weights like pretty much every day. Um, and now I am not lifting weights as often as I used to, and I don't feel as great. Um, I, lean wise, I'm pretty lean, but I just don't feel as strong and like as confident. And so I'm really like getting back into working out slowly. It's hard to like regain the habit after you've lost it, but um, I really do love it. And I, I think you can work out from home, no problem. I think it's really a personal preference. Like if I had a full-time job and I was working from nine to five, then I would probably work out out from home because I wouldn't want to have to spend the time like tr commuting to the gym or I might like go to the gym and then go straight to uh work afterwards so um I, I understand working from home and I think it's absolutely possible put on some like whatever music you like I I go through phases um right now I'm like super into like Cardi B and just rap like straight up rap um but and, and just work out for like 20 to 30 minutes Will the official last day of our cycle of your cycle be when you fully stop having any bleeding or when you are lightly spotting by the end? Um, sorry, my dog gets a little impatient. Buddy, what the heck? He gets so, like, he wants in, he wants to hang out, and then he wants to get out. And that's just how he is. Um, so, uh, 
uh, well, the, the end of your whole menstrual cycle is the day before you start your period. The day you start your period is day one of your, of your cycle. Um, but when you actually stop your period, um, uh, I would say like when you fully stop bleeding would be when you're stopping your period. Um, but yeah, if you're talking about your whole menstrual cycle, your cycle lasts about 28 days and the last day of the cycle is, um, the day before you start your period. I don't know if you if I missed your response on your favorite sprouted grains. Yeah, you did. It was just like millet, uh, buckwheat, but go back and uh, listen to <clears throat> what I talk about because uh, it's important that they're prepared properly. On collagen and gelatin, that gelatin is hard <laughs> to blend though. On magnesium, we'll have to check cortisol again. I don't feel stressed. Do you have any tips for acne scarring? Mine won't budge. Yeah, so keep in mind, you guys, sugar is a humectant. So sugar is really powerful for bringing blood flow and hydration and minerals to the skin and getting um, getting the body to heal quickly. This is why they used to pack wounds with sugar um, before like modern medicine was like what it is now because it really rapidly healed wounds. So I like to do honey. Um, I like to do even like just straight up sugar masks. Um, and you can also do like vitamin E is very healing, shea butter, uh, cacao butter. Those are all rapid healers. Um, but yeah, I would check out my, my girl Healthy Skin Glows. She talks about acne scarring a lot. I think she has even a blog post on it and she's really, really amazing. Any tips for adult ADHD? Yeah, get your gut figured out for sure. Um, anytime you're you're developing like um, mental I don't want to say mental disorders that's more like mental dis imbalances um, we know there's way too much evidence that ADHD ADD depression anxiety is has a has a huge gut component and so um, get the balance of, of the microbiome good start start working on that get a comprehensive gut test done and work on your microbiome for three to four months. Yeah, it might cost a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars, but um, it, it can make a huge, huge difference. Do I need to work out? All I do is walk, but I'm not lifting or going to the gym. No, you don't need to work out as long as you're moving your body. Um, I personally think that like, I didn't really know how crappy I felt until I didn't, until I started working out and realized like, oh my gosh, working out just makes me feel so good. Like having muscle makes me feel so good, but that's different for everybody. And I don't think anyone needs to work out. I think you really have to work out in a way that you enjoy. Um, but moving your body is very important. And if you're just relying upon walking for exercise and you're healthy and you can handle it, what I mean is like, I work with a lot of people who have chronic illness and they can't quite handle workouts yet. Um, but they have to work up to it. But if you're just relying upon walking for exercise, then uh, your goal should be about 10,000 steps a day. So 10,000 steps a day um, is about the equivalent of um, an hour of walking or so. Since FN, it could be the reason why my cycles went from 33 to 29. Good. Yeah, you want your cycles to be around like 28-ish days um, and you want them to be consistent. So yeah, that's actually pretty good. Can you explain why vitamin E can reduce hirsutism? Thank you. Yeah, because vitamin E is blocking estrogen and estrogen can turn into um, testosterone in the liver. In addition, estrogen is a stress hormone and um, it can drive a lot of stress in the tissues, including the skin tissue. And we know hirsutism is driven by elevated DHT in the skin tissue. So, you know, you can still have normal levels of DHT in the blood and have elevated skin DHT. Um, and we know that estrogen can cause that conversion. So yes, you want to block, uh, you don't want to like, you don't want low estrogen, you want good estrogen. And you definitely don't want um, a lot of estrogen um, uh, being converted into testosterone. <laughs> Big thighs and hips, what PCOS I might have. PCOS, I only walk and get too much uh, tired, so should I be going to the gym? Uh, Big thighs and hips. Um, I couldn't tell you like what type of PCOS you have. There's really no like, there's a lot of people that say like, oh, there's types of PCOS and no, they're all driven by similar issues, stress, estrogen. But estrogen, elevated estrogen in relationship to progesterone usually tends to uh, cause you to store a lot of, of fat in the hips and the thighs. So I would definitely look into your estrogen and your progesterone. Hey, can you talk about how to take bioidentical progesterone, please? I have long cycles, 40, 48, 
to 70 days. I've talked about this a lot, you guys. Um, you kind of have to experiment and do it yourself. The goal is to kind of mimic a natural cycle, but obviously when you have long cycles, it can sometimes be a little off. So you would kind of want to go start around the time would be mid cycle, a normal mid cycle. So your goal is to think about, yes, you have abnormal cycles, but your goal is to mimic a normal cycle, which you start creating progesterone around day 14. So you would want to start around then, and then you would want to, God, my dog, dude, you guys, it's hard to have a puppy and so hard. It's like, God, you know, especially when he's a hundred pounds of wool. Come on. He kills me. He kills me. He kills me. He kills me. Okay. Anyways, um, so you would want to mimic a a, a mid cycle your mid cycle progesterone. A lot of times, starting then and then maybe taking it for fourteen days. Some people can stop taking it at that fourteen day mark and um, and uh, and get a period. They can actually bring on a bleed. But some people uh, can't do that, and so they'll end up taking it until they start their period the next time around. It just kind of is honestly your choice. And um, that is where you have to kind of get your own research and do your own research, research and figure out what's best for you. Some people take it all cycle long. Some people uh, choose to only take it for 14 days on and 14 days off. So it's really what you think is best, and you might have to experiment to figure out what's best. But I can't really tell you what is proper. It's more that um, you have to kind of find what works for your body. But there's no like wrong way to take it. It's more just like figuring out what you need. How did you get your dislocated shoulder fixed? Well, it actually popped back into place, which was, oh God, I don't even want to think about it. So it's just disgusting. Um, and I went, I immediately went to the chiropractor. I just left the gym, went to the chiropractor and he said like, yeah, you dislocated your shoulder, but it's back in. So uh, all you have to do, like he adjusted me and then just said like, you got to let it heal. And I couldn't work out, couldn't, uh, didn't let it heal or couldn't really move it. It was so, it hurt so bad for, um, like eight weeks or so like it was destroyed my shoulder was just destroyed sometimes I get palpitations after bedtime snacks what could cause this um it could be that you are eating something that doesn't work for you you're doing too many carbohydrates you might need a little bit more protein you need more minerals something like that so maybe experiment with what it is that you're going to use and um and for your bedtime snack, sorry, my dog's distracting me. So sometimes I'm like, ah, oh. um, you, you might have to experiment around a little bit. Some people need less carbs, more fat. Some people need more carbs, less fat. Some people need some protein at the bedtime snack. So you kind of have to, um, figure out what works for you. Um, my forehead is getting bigger day by day and I'm only 17. Any tips for growing hair again? Getting to the bottom of what is causing your hair loss is very important. So it could be thyroid issues. It's probably estrogen related. I know you said you had a lot of weight in your hips and thighs. Where are your progesterone levels? Do you have normal cycles? I highly recommend looking through my cycle or my cycle highlights, my highlights and starting to learn more about your body and figuring out what it could be because it could be a lot of things. Hair loss has uh, a lot to do with inflammation it can have a lot to do with nutrient imbalances and a lot to do with just imbalanced hormones in general lots of stress undernourishment over exercising so you kind of have to start like eliminating things and figure out what that is functional lab testing can help it's what why I help my clients with that um, but you know it you can get to the bottom of it I can only find Bayer's aspirin what do you think about that good or bad because of additives I think it's just kind of what you feel is best um if, if it doesn't bother you or anything like that um I don't see a problem with it um if, if that's something that you want to try um is it bad that I feel strange in stomach after eating little raspberry and always see seeds from it in my stool um it's not bad necessarily, but that might not be like a lot of times berries and the seeds in berries, specifically things like raspberries, blackberries. Do you also get weird feelings when you eat like seeds in general, like nuts and seeds, because that can be kind of irritating to the gut and cause anxiety. So um, if that's the case, you might not be digesting it very well. And that's why you see it in your um in your uh, stool. Should I only drink red raspberry leaf tea before period, not during? 
Um, I drink it all the time, um, but if that's really your choice, I don't really, um, I, I, I try to like oversimplify things because I just like, I hate rules and I don't like when like, I'm like, okay, I gotta drink it here and not drink it here. Like I just start to get really overwhelmed and like really angry, really. Like I just get like so burnt out that I just don't want to do anything healthy. So I just keep things overly simple and I personally drink it all the time, but that's just me. Have you heard if it's possible to heal anhedonia? I've never heard of that as well. Some things I've just never heard of you guys and I'm not a doctor, like I apologize, but um, I don't know because I'm not really sure what that is. My naturopath said my progesterone could be causing androgenic symptoms. Did, does this make sense? Um, no, but um, I guess it could in a sense, like it, maybe it's, it's bringing out estrogen and the estrogen's turning to testosterone. Uh, personally, no, but I guess um, maybe she has a reasoning. Did you ask her what her reasoning is, why that, that would be? A lot of times when you ask why, they don't have a good explanation. And so you're like, okay. But it, it, she could have a great explanation and, and give you that reason. You should ask that same question to her. Why would my progesterone be causing androgenic symptoms? That would be a question. Yes, I always also get palpitations after bedtime snack, always. Interesting, you guys. Well, maybe you should try not eating a bedtime snack and see how you sleep and see how your morning temps and pulses are because not everyone needs a bedtime snack. What does it mean if I use progesterone on day 22 or on day 14 but start bleeding on day 22? Um, you may not be using enough or you're, you have so much estrogen that you're mobilizing because estrogen can, can thicken the uterine lining. There could be a few things. Um, how much are you using? Um, have you experimented with different amounts? And, um, do you know when you're ovulating? Cause sometimes you're ovulating a lot earlier. And so you're not realizing like you're ovulating around 10 or day 10 or 11. And so you're starting your period, you know, 12-ish days after your ovulation so I don't know you'd have to kind of I'd have to kind of see like where you're ovulating where are you starting your progesterone and then like what's going on there yeah I'm not sure could be because when I took it it made my melasma worse I think it's all how it converts well yeah progesterone does keep in mind it like brings estrogen out melasma is totally an estrogen symptom so um, when you take progesterone yeah your estrogen is finally mobilizing from your tissue sometimes for the first time in a long time especially if you've gone a long time with really low progesterone and so if you're mobilizing estrogen but then your liver's not detoxifying properly or your liver's converting via aromatase so it's called aromatization your liver can convert estrogen to testosterone that is it's not the progesterone causing high testosterone it's that estrogen is turning into testosterone because of an unhealthy liver or an unhealthy gut and um because it can happen in either place so you want to make sure you're focused on bioflow make sure you're focused on gut health make sure your liver is your utmost priority um and uh really just let the estrogen move. Vitamin E is very, very helpful when you have estrogen-based symptoms. It really does. It's very powerful at blocking estrogen, you guys. And um, I prefer it over things like DIM and, and calcium deglucurate, unless you've done a Dutch test and you know exactly which phase of detoxification is struggling. Vitamin C is also very helpful. Magnesium is also very helpful. Milk thistle is also very helpful. Chlorophyll is also very helpful. Coffee enemas are very helpful. Castor oil packs are very helpful. So um, when you're mobilizing estrogen, be, while taking progesterone, you know, okay, um, estrogen is really mobilizing. I got to take some, some steps to really open up my detoxification pathways and make that process easier. Girl, I know this isn't the goal, but I've lost six pounds since FN. Whoa, that's like a, a month and a half. Did you, did you sign up right when it came out, like July 15th? That's crazy. Six pounds. Um, uh, it's just inflammation. You guys, like when you are focusing on digestibility of food and, uh, you really, your body composition changes very quickly. She said, my body looks different and I'm legit more happy and calm. It's also a fun way of eating. I know, right? Like it feels like you're not on a diet for the first time in your life. And it's just like so delicious. Um, I'm so happy because 
I'm really trying to teach you guys that real whole foods and staying away from all these like quote unquote health foods like nut milks and all these nuts and seeds and like raw greens and like all this freaking broccoli, it, it, it really does help your health. It doesn't take away from your health, it helps your health. I know some of the stuff can be rough, especially that first transition because you're lowering cortisol, you're lowering adrenaline and those stress hormones, even though they're bad for you and they really um, damage you long term, they do give you artificial feelings of well-being or they do kind of sometimes keep inflammation low and so when you actually actively lower those stress hormones you're cre almost doing this like whole rebalance you're like let's just picture it like a wheels turning this way and you have to like slow the wheel down first of all and then start turning it the other way it takes some time and it kind of like can be a shitstorm at first you know so it's like you are doing the right things there's nothing wrong um you really want to support your liver support your gut but um estrogen detox can be a bitch like i'll be honest it's, it's just so rough and it's not necessarily fun especially if it's been stored in your tissues for so long and like I feel so bad because there's so many people that come to me that have worked with like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten functional practitioners, whether they're nutritionists, whether they're functional medicine doctors, naturopaths, and these doctors do not understand that estrogen stores in the tissues. It does not store in the blood. So it's like for, for these people, they've always been told they have low estrogen. Oh, you have like normal estrogen or like on the lower side. And I'm like, you do not. You need progesterone first and then watch those estrogen levels just skyrocket to the sky. And it happens every single time. Every single time. I've only had a few people that truly have low estrogen because they have low DHEA and just low adrenal output. But really, most of the time when you have PCOS or other issues, estrogen is in the tissues and it, it starts to move and it, it's not fun. Also, periods have improved. Haven't received my thermometer from Amazon yet, though. Okay, yeah, just uh, I'm glad your periods are improving. I know they can be really tough at first. Sometimes those detox periods are nasty. Like when I first, when I went from keto, then to back to like more pro-metabolic eating, like what I teach in Fully Nourish, my periods went from being actually really good on keto um, um, they were scant. They, I was. I, I think if I would have stayed on keto for like two or three more months, I would have completely lost my period. Um, but they were not symptomatic at all. But when I went on to like a more pro-metabolic style of eating, oh my gosh, for the first like two months, I was like, kill me. I've, I hadn't had a bad period like that in like years. And I, I know it now that keto causes you to store estrogen and, and actually converts testosterone into estrogen very easily. Okay, so which one to prioritize? Getting a quality water filter or non-toxic cookware? I can only afford one or the other right now. Water filter all the way. Just because you use it a lot, you know? And non-toxic cookware, like, you um, just keep your, like, if you have toxic cookware, like, stainless, not stainless, but, um, uh, Teflon, just keep things very, very low heat. I know it's kind of annoying, but just don't cook at a higher heat. And, um, like if you have aluminum baking sheets and stuff like that, just cover it with parchment paper. You know what I mean? Like you can do a few things to really like eliminate the runoff, but I would definitely prioritize a water filter first. I haven't been ovulating. I was hoping to, hoping that progesterone would kickstart everything for me. Okay, so I just wanted to know that. Becca, if you haven't been ovulating, then um, you might have, if you normally have shorter periods, um, that could be, like, it might take a few cycles for the progesterone to lengthen your, your period uh, or your, your cycle altogether. Um, I'm trying to think of what else it could be. Sometimes when, like I've always talked about, like I've been talking about, is progesterone does mobilize estrogen, which can really lead to like early cycles, uh, irregular periods. Um, it thickens your uterine lining. So sometimes if you're moving a lot of estrogen at first, you can have some really wonky cycles. It's not anything the progesterone is doing. It's just your body is really like starting to mobilize things. Um, just keep an eye on it. Every cycle should get better. That's kind of the goal is, um, it, I always say like three months, I swear to God, is the magic number, like 90 days, 90 to 100 days. And everyone doesn't believe me. They're like, Jessica, this is so horrible like I feel horrible like and I'm like have things improved have there been any tiny improvements and they're like yes yes it has but like I still feel horrible and I'm like give it three months let's keep going let's keep going let's keep going and they're like oh my god like ah. and then at the 90 or 100 day mark they're like Jessica 
this period was great. And I'm like, I know because it's been a hundred days, you know? So it, it does take some time. And like, I swear the 90 to hundred days is, is it were every single time there are small, tiny improvements. But once that in three months has really gone by, the, the improvements start to be bigger and change. And it's like almost like a snowball effect. Like things just really start to change and shift. So give it some time. Um, you want to always keep an eye on on everything. If anything feels off, you always want to let your doctor know. Um, but I, I wouldn't stress too much. I know sometimes like when we implement something, we think like, okay, I want it now. Like it needs to happen now, but it does take some time. Are any ancient grains okay to eat or are there better ones? I personally like um, uh, spelt and iron corn wheat. So this is what I put in fully nourished. But I also like things like buckwheat, millet, um, uh, kamut, like things like that in small amounts, teff. Um, I personally don't really enjoy them, so I'm not going to eat them very frequently. Sprouted organic oats or gluten-free oats or something that I, I will enjoy from time to time, like if I don't feel like having eggs for breakfast or a smoothie for breakfast. Um, but I personally like don't love grains. I like white rice, but um, there's not like a bunch of grains. Where I'm like, mm, give me all the buckwheat. Like ugh, I could take it or leave it. But they can be really good for your gut bacteria in small amounts. They can act like prebiotics. So um, again, just making sure they're they're properly sprouted and fermented. Like for example, when it comes to like uh, heirloom, like gluten containing grains, like spelt and um, einkorn, uh, I, I really recommend uh, making a sourdough out of them. So having the yeast actually break down the gluten and uh, create B vitamins for a while before you actually bake it. Thoughts on getting hair dyed at a salon? Girl, I get my hair dyed at a salon. I can't, there are certain things where I really choose my battles. That's why I try to eliminate toxins from as many areas as possible. So when I do go to the salon, I don't have to feel like, oh gosh, I'm doing something, another toxic thing. For me, it feels so good to have freshly colored hair and uh, it just makes me feel better about myself and makes me excited. I am not going to, you know, cry over a toxin exposure every couple months. Um, but again, it's kind of up to you. Like for example, when I first got diagnosed with my autoimmune diseases and polycystic ovarian syndrome, it was very, I was uber careful. For example, like I didn't get my hair dyed for six months. I wouldn't even like touch toxins at all. Whereas like now I'm a little bit more relaxed because I've gone through a lot of healing. I've really gotten like my detoxification pathways open. My hormones are balanced. Like everything is kind of moving in the right direction. So I'm not as like meticulous about my toxin exposure. So you kind of have to weigh what's going on with you and then decide what's best for you. I read that salt bath helps with detoxifying radiation of flying. Or is this legit or just BS? It, it totally does, as does iodine. Um, I, I will usually do, because um, you are exposed to a lot of radiation when you fly or travel. So I any type of like salt, baking soda, magnesium, things like that, minerals are so powerful, you guys. They really are very powerful. I really like a good detox bath when like after travel or after like I get some type of toxic exposure with eight cups of Epsom salt, so a lot. Like it would be pretty much a full small bag or like a half of a big bag. And then two like really heaping cups of either sea salt, like dead sea salt. You can get a big bag on Amazon or baking soda. And then I like this thing called Dr. Shinga's mustard bath and you can get it on Amazon. It's like this blue can and it makes you sweat like crazy. Like you go into that bath and just expect to like sweat half your water, like your water weight off because it is really, really, I don't know. It's just so like, it feels great. So that's what I like to do. Like, pre-period if I'm feeling yucky or if I just want to you know detoxify that is a great one yeah but bad I don't digest well raspberry and see so many improvements in digesting all other foods can you please tell about the proteolytic enzymes how do we know if we need it Proteolytic enzymes are meant to clear toxic proteins from the blood. So they're different than digestive enzymes. Digestive enzymes are for the purpose of taking, taking while you eat to help your body break down your food, take a little burden off the body there. But proteolytic enzymes are completely different. They're meant to go throughout the body, be absorbed into the bloodstream, and go through the body and break down proteins and um, like fibro fibrotic tissue, fibrosis. So proteolytic enzymes are very powerful. Um, they should be really not taken lightly. Like they should be done very, um, very conservatively at first until you can increase the dose because they really can be so powerful. There are people that have literally, if they take too much, I tell them, I'm like, you know, only take one 
one and then see how you do and then you know keep moving it up they're taken on an empty stomach so that they don't help you digest your food you want them to absorb into the bloodstream and I've seen people projectile vomit um, from them because they just don't understand how powerful they are and they like pop three thinking like oh you know I'm gonna be fine and then they just vomit and uh, it's because they're so powerful so proteolytic enzymes should be taken in between meals on an empty stomach about an hour away from food um, they should be kind of you should always pay attention before you move up your dose and they should usually be taken for a period of time they are contraindicated in pregnancy and nursing they can they can cause like a miscarriage they can cause they're very powerful at at getting rid of anything that um, is in, is inflammatory like proteins in the blood so you gotta make sure that we're not pregnant or nursing and uh, but yes that they break down scar tissue they're very excellent for that inflammation they do take a while to to work so it, it really is a good idea to take them from for six to eight weeks before you expect to see huge results but proteolytics specifically like serapeptase and natokinase and um, like papain and bromelain they, they can be very powerful at reducing inflammation in the body um, it was because she said progesterone makes testosterone. Yikes. Nope. Nope. Uh, there are a lot of people that don't understand hormones and that is not true. Do you know how much oral allergy syndrome? Been trying to increase fruit intake since avoiding fructose for a while. I struggle with itchy mouth and lips and feel like my throat is closing. Yeah, obviously don't eat things that are, are causing a, a, an inflammatory reaction, but there's something going on, right? Um, I, I would check your thyroid. I would make sure that um, your gut's not disrupted. There's probably histamine issues. Maybe look for a low histamine probiotic or a histamine breaking down, a, a, a probiotic that breaks down histamines because nine times out of 10 allergy reactions are caused by histamines and um, if your body's having a hard time clearing them or breaking them down, um, that could be what can cause some allergies. I also lost four kilograms in like two months, all inflammation. Oh, that's amazing. Is there anything that can be done to naturally clear blocked fallopian tubes? I have HSC, HSC next, oh God, HSG next week, and I'm worried about what they'll find. Well, girl, we talk about no worries until you get it done, and then you can worry afterwards. But actually, proteolytics, speaking of the devil, uh, have been shown. If you go look on proteolytic enzymes, you can actually read a lot of Amazon reviews, and a lot of women with like PCOS, endometriosis, um, blocked fallopian tubes have used them to completely clear their their fallopian tubes because fl blocked fallopian tubes are just kind of caused by fibrosis or fibrotic scar tissue and so um just let me know like let me know what your results are and uh we'll talk about them i'll tell you how to take proteolytics you can ask your doctor about it okay so don't stress please don't stress about it a thermometer digital or the old mercury ones i heard digital is not as reliable definitely not if you can get your hands on an old mercury one i think they're like the best um i have a hard time finding them i like i don't know why I know Amazon has a few, but like a lot of the, a lot of them have like poor reviews. So I am in, 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 um, the market for a source, a good source of an old mercury thermometer. And I, I, I might like just go to like some type of like science or biology, like supply store. I don't know. I got to figure it out, but yeah, the mercury ones are as are more accurate. Is stainless steel for pots okay? Yeah, if you already have them, yes. If you're going to buy new ones, no. So stainless tends to have toxins that leach into the food not as bad as like something like teflon or something else but they're not stainless they're not perfect so i wouldn't like go out of your way to like buy brand new stainless thinking they're non-toxic because they're not um they they do still do have some toxic exposure just not as much as as something like teflon i got fn the hour it came out i was waiting haha -ha. yes six pounds and i'm eating so much doesn't it feel good like to, to eat a lot and to not gain weight and uh i haven't had nut milk since yeah i haven't had nut milk in a long time and like let's be honest man i don't i don't miss the nut juice thank you so much for spending this time on us you're the best i love my lives you guys like you guys are really honestly fun can I use buckwheat flour for the banana bread instead of gluten-free flour? Yeah, you can use whatever you want, guys. Like, I, I really want you to take Fully Nourished and, like, make it your own. Like, it's really a foundation. It's this, like I say, it's the beginning. It's not the end. And uh, I want to get, like, there are so many things that you, you know, when you're building a program like that, like, if you talked about every single detail, it would just be monotonous and boring. So it's like, I want you guys, I want it to be mostly, like, you're getting permission to enjoy food and to utilize food I'm teaching you about your food you know preparing grains is important um, but 
you know, gluten-free grains tend to be work really well with a lot of women, especially if you're using them uh, without a bunch of polyunsaturated fats. So, you know, your you, Fully Nourished focuses in on those anti-inflammatory saturated fats, and it really helps you tolerate and utilize glucose better. It also makes starches like grains easier for your gut to digest and break down. So overall, yes, you can use whatever you want. I don't know, the only thing is, I don't know how the banana bread would turn out with buckwheat flour, but I'm sure it will turn out good. I just, it might taste a little different, but that doesn't mean it'll be bad. So you're gonna have to tell me how it goes. Um, I'm sure the girls in the Facebook group would like to know. Um, everyone, the Facebook group in Fully Nourish, you guys, is like popping. Like, I love you guys so much. Sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, I gotta like reply to all these things. But um, I, I <laughs> yeah, I love the Facebook group for Fully Nourish because everyone's like so just on it they are on it um unfortunately i don't have a bath what else could i do instead of the salt bath for flying okay so when you guys don't have a bath a, a quick thing because there are people that don't have baths you know like it's annoying but it is what it is you can do saunas or you can also do foot baths don't underestimate the power of a good foot bath so if you have like a big bowl or even like a foot bath like unit i don't know what they're called um fill it with the same thing that you would put in the bath and just like i always like we'll just like pull up a chair put a towel down put my hot foot bath down because sometimes it's like i don't want to take a bath especially in the middle of summer it's like ugh. um and i'll just let my feet soak for like 30 minutes keep in mind lots of stuff will fall will fall will detoxify from your feet and uh, you can still get a lot of benefit i feel great after doing like a mustard foot bath and it's kind of like a half bath you know like you don't have to like you know sweat and, and cover your whole body, but um, you definitely can get some benefit from it. What are your thoughts about antidepressants with really deep depression, losing all sensations, not understanding emotions? Um, I always say like it's very important to understand how they affect the body. Um, their goal is to numb, not to fix. And um, they the way that they do so is having you reuptake serotonin often and sometimes adrenaline. Sometimes they're necessary, um, but I think a lot of times they're over prescribed. I highly recommend checking out the A Mind of Your Own by Dr. Kelly Brogan. When you're struggling with a lot of uh, mental issues, uh, keep in mind it's always going to be gut related. She talks a lot about the gut connection with the brain. She talks about antidepressants and how dangerous and damaging they are to a lot of people. So um, I think it's really important to know what you're getting yourself into. Um, and, and the reason I just say it, and I, I never and like against any type of medication. It, there are always times when there are certain medications are just completely necessary and they can save someone's life. However, it, I see I'm always on the flip side of it. I'm always the one that is fixing issues that years of taking these things have caused. And so I've seen like, I've been with people as their doctors have weaned them off of antidepressants and it is very rough. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy and I, 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 to me, it's just very hard to watch. I'm there with my clients. I make sure they're nourishing themselves. I make sure they're detoxifying and, and, and working on their bodies. But it can be like, you know, a good three to four months of just things rough. And sometimes there is metabolic damage that has to be repaired or gut, gut damage that has to be repaired. So overall, like I, I'm just very, um, I just recommend like women be cautious and it's not, you know, once you're on them, you have to take them every day. And if you ever want to decide to go off them, they have to be weaned off of properly like with the supervision of a doctor so you have to just like know what you're getting into but um, I think a mind of your own by Dr. Kelly Brogan would be something that's really good to read or listen to on audible what are your thoughts on cacao nibs I think they're disgusting I just don't like them but um, I don't think there's anything wrong with them keep in mind guys that um, cacao and and cocoa is a bean and when you're eating raw cacao um, it tends to have a lot more phytonutrients it's like eating raw seeds as opposed to cook so sometimes um, cooked cacao or cooked chocolate like cocoa powder um, people tend to tolerate it a lot better what is a great ice cream alternative that isn't made with the bad oils? Yeah, like, so Haagen-Dazs is one that's not organic, but it doesn't have any bad oils in it. Most of the flavors, like all the fancy flavors will, but like strawberry, coffee, chocolate, vanilla, those are, are pretty clean. If you want to go for something more organic, I like Strauss brand. Um, Strauss's organic ice cream is so good. Like, I don't know. I just love it so much. Um, it's just delish. Uh, but you're just going to want to turn the ingredients around. But yeah, Haagen-Dazs 
Häagen-Dazs and Strauss are kind of my top four, my top two, or I just make my own. You mentioned the other day that you take vitamin D. Just curious, which one do you recommend? I don't take vitamin D. Um, I take it only if I feel if I am low or if I um, am not getting enough sun. But I, I rarely do take it, and a lot of times and a lot of people it can cause a lot more harm than good. I'm actually not a big fan of, of, of high dose vitamin D supplements, and I think a lot of times low vitamin D goes misdiagnosed. Because keep in mind, there's two measures: there's 25 OH vitamin D, and then there's 100 OH vitamin D. 25 OH vitamin D can be on the lower side, but that doesn't mean your actual measure for vitamin D, your 100 OH vitamin D is low. So um, vitamin D can cause calcification, it can cause metabolic issues if you're not taking it when you should be taking it. But when I do take it, um, I take like a liquid one like Carlson's or Thorn. I always take it with, oh, I, sorry, I saw that now, God, you just, uh, I saw that you corrected it to vitamin E, sorry. So um, that was a tangent on vitamin D, but vitamin E, I take Unique E, um, and it's by oh, AC Grace. So um, you can type in Unique E on Amazon and find vitamin E. Can you recommend a low histamine probiotic? I, I can't think of one on top of my head. You're gonna have to do your own research, but I believe Dr. Grace Luz, um, the Gut Institute, she has one that is a low histamine antibiotic or er, uh, probiotic. Advice for trying to conceive naturally for PCOS, watch all my highlight stories, especially the one on fertility. But yeah, watch all of them. You gotta, you gotta make sure your progesterone levels are good. Gotta make sure your thyroid is good. Are you ovulating? Are you nourishing yourself? Are you eating good for, um, for fertility? Keep in mind, you guys, that we, we have this idea that like babies are built out of thin air or our bodies run on thin air. And when we are, when we have PCOS, we are, our cells are starving. And the first step is nourishment. We have to nourish ourselves in order for our bodies to feel safe to nourish a, a child or a baby or a fetus. Remember, when you're growing a baby, it is a rapidly, rapidly um, growing cells. And so you need to have the nourishment and the ability to to build that on top of keep your body running. And so the body knows this. Um, there are also certain hormones that need to be in place, specifically progesterone, but um, there are, you know, your thyroid function has to be good, your gut has to be good, because you're passing your health and imprinting your health onto that child. And again, the body knows this. So it's very important to make sure, first of all, you're nourished, second of all, your stress is low, Third of all, your hormones are balanced. And fourth of all, your gut and liver function are good. Because if you're having a rough time with your health now, pregnancy is gonna be even rougher. And birth is gonna be, um, you know, birth is birth, but postpartum is the biggest thing. I think a lot of times we think like, oh, I want this baby, but do, do you wanna be able to take care of that baby? Or do you wanna feel exhausted and sick and, unable to care for that child when it comes. And that is what a lot of people don't think about. I know we want this baby and I know we, but we also want the best life for our child. And we want to make sure that we are able to handle that child and have the health to do so. And so sometimes we, we jump the gun a little bit. We don't prepare our bodies for pregnancy and we expect them to rebound post-pregnancy like nothing is wrong. And I'm like, uh, it's not gonna happen. Sometimes postpartum can be the worst part. And so we have to make sure that we're prepared pre-pregnancy, treat it almost as our pre-pregnancy phase, nourishing our body, taking care of ourselves, lowering our stress, getting enough sun, getting exercise, strengthening our muscles, um, preparing ourselves. And so when we do conceive, we are now able to grow this child. And then on top of it, we can take care of the child afterwards without feeling like we're gonna die. Because keep in mind, when that newborn comes, there's gonna be a lack of sleep, there's gonna be a lot of stress, it's gonna be like, you know, you're gonna love that baby, but it's also gonna be very, very, a big transition. It's a, it's a big time of your life, and you wanna be prepared to handle it. And uh, you're also in this vulnerable position where you just had, you just gave birth and you just grew a child for nine months. So it, it is something that should be taken seriously. We shouldn't try to force it, especially if our bodies are not ready. And especially if our bodies um, are telling us no, no, no at every corner. 
So I ch would recommend checking out uh, the book called Real Food for Pregnancy um, and uh, make sure you check your hormones and watch all my story highlights. And uh, and I, I do want to talk about fertility more. I think fertility is really important and uh, it is really um, a part of having balanced hormones. Fertility comes when the body feels safe enough to reproduce. All right, guys, last call, last call for questions. Uh, Instagram is giving me one more minute and then um, these these lives will be put on YouTube uh, so that I, that's why I got to end it a little early so I can save them. But I appreciate you guys spending your Friday mornings. I know I just like spent two hours talking, but I always love these lives and um, I have a lot of con content coming to you for PCOS Awareness Month, so stay tuned. There is a, a lot of content coming that has been planned. All right, you guys. Well, I'm not seeing any questions come in. So, oh, okay. Trying to control anxiety due to excitement. Any tips? Um, deep breathing is important. Um, making sure that you know how to like relax yourself a little bit. I really like to have adaptogens on hand if it gets too bad, like rhodiola or valerian or something like that. Um, lemon balm and just overall like deep breathing, meditation, um, even like um, singing bowls, listening to singing bowls on YouTube can be helpful. Um, but yeah, just overall like journaling, managing stress, deep breathing, and then adaptogens can be really helpful. All right, guys, I love you and I'll talk to you soon.